If you have a Bible with you, I invite you to turn to 1 Samuel 14. White chalky rocks, accented by short tufted green grass, made it difficult to find a clearing in which to camp near the commander's hometown of Gibeah, north of Jerusalem. Coming back home should have been a place of rest, to rest weary bodies in familiar surroundings. But there, on the outskirts of town, the division of soldiers rested, licking their wounds. It wasn't the sting of battle that had their commander flinch and squirm, but the rebuke of the prophet, the seer, the holy man, Samuel, the last judge of Israel. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. It wasn't long ago a nobody from the tiny tribe of Benjamin called a nation to arms. And with Samuel by his side, he led a troop, a group of men, 330,000 men in all, from Israel and Judah, into victorious battle against the Amorites. Then, in a solemn ceremony before Yahweh God, they appointed a nobody to become the most important somebody, Saul, the first king of Israel. But in what must have seemed like an adrenaline-charged distant dream, Reality now bit hard. Another foe, the Philistine army flexed their muscles and at their sight, Israel's finest fighting men trembled with fear. Saul's troops were outnumbered and ill-equipped as the plague of the Philistine army consumed the ground before them, with numbers like the grains of sand on the seashore. Dignified retreat gave way to desperate survival as the soldiers scattered, hiding in caves, thickets and behind rocks. Others dove into holes and empty wells while those with the legs to carry them ran for their lives. It was a pathetic sight. Desperate to save face and somehow stem the flood of fear running rampant through his troops, Saul Instead of waiting on the holy man Samuel to bring an offering to Yahweh, desperate Saul took matters into his own hands. Slaughtering the animals and offering the sacrifices, Saul tried to find favour with uh, God. But instead, he set the wheels in motion, sealing his fate and ending his reign as king. Such was the absolute stronghold of the Philistine forces over Israel. Once proud farmers were forced to pay their enemies to sharpen farm tools. Only Saul and his firstborn son, Jonathan, were able to lay their hands on a sword each. With only 600 of his men left by his side, Saul made his way back to his hometown of Gibeah, tail tucked firmly between his legs, still reeling from the rebuke of Samuel. Defeated and dejected, the man made camp on the outskirts of town under a large and around a large pomegranate tree. And then under its shade sat a defeated king of Israel, like a beaten dog licking his wounds, no one dared disturb Saul. Minutes turned to hours and hours turned to days as they sat. And while Saul sulked, five kilometres northeast of their position, the Philistines strengthened their stronghold over Israel, establishing an outpost at the pass of Michmash which helped to join the west to the east. Jonathan, 
Saul's son, became increasingly restless with the weight. His willing hand went to his short sword, clasping its handle. The double-edged blade slid easily through the air with a flick of the wrist. While his father, the king, was paralysed with fear, Jonathan was not prepared to let this new day finish as the last. Cats must not have frequented Jonathan's family home, for he knew nothing of the consequences of curiosity. And it was curiosity and conviction that got the better of Jonathan. Turning to his armour bearer, Jonathan leant over so that others couldn't hear. Come on, let's go over to where the Philistines have their outpost. Knowing the request would bring such a negative response, Jonathan bypassed his father and the two set out in stealth on their reckless adventure to the Philistine outpost overlooking the Michmash Pass. I can imagine over the next few hours the conversation between Jonathan and his armour bearer, recounting past battles, stories of Yahweh God's victories and what uh, they might find as they arrived at the Michmash Pass. Being an armour bearer was more than some sort of soldier's caddy. Still, there were not many in the role. After all, there are only two people in the, um, in, the arm, in the army that required armour bearing, Saul and Jonathan. And while being appointed as an armour bearer was not quite a death sentence, life insurance premiums would have suggested otherwise. As they walked over stony ground to avoid known paths, I can't help but wonder whether this armour bearer was considering if he had chosen the right career path. To reach the Philistine outpost, Jonathan had to go between two rocky cliffs that were called Bozes and Sina. Bozes to the north glistened with sun-drenched rocks reflecting light back over and across the ravine. These rocks over years had become smooth and slippery and reflected well the light rays. Sina, on the south, was more sheltered and provided a host for thorny scrub that tore at flesh and clothing alike. The view from the Philistine outpost meant that barely a lizard could scurry through the ravine without attracting the Philistine gaze. Such was the confidence and the strength in the, their position, the Philistine army knew that only a fool would cross the ravine at this point. The descent down Sina into the ravine would leave the fool scratched and bloody, while the slow hand and foot ascent up Bozes, slippery rocks would render such a determined fool exposed and exhausted. As they neared Sina and the, river, uh, the ravine beneath, Jonathan turned once again to his armour bearer. Let's go across to the outpost of those pagans. Perhaps the Lord will help us, for nothing can hinder the Lord. He can win the battle, whether he has many warriors or only a few. And I don't think he can have many fewer than two. Whether there was something in Jonathan's steely glaze or the strength in his voice or the cheeky glint in the corner of his smile that captured the heart of the armour bearer. Well, after all, we've come this far, Jonathan, and if you believe in God this much, why shouldn't I? With faith and conviction, the armour bearer replied, do what you think is best. I am with you completely, whatever you decide. I am with you heart and soul. So Jonathan, what's your plan? 
Do we rest now and, and move through the ravine under the cover of darkness so that we can sneak up and take them by surprise? What's your plan? All right then, Jonathan told him. We'll cross over and let them see us. If they say to us, stay where you are or we'll kill you, then we'll stop and not go up to them. But if they say, come on up and fight, then we'll go up. That will be the Lord's sign that he will help us defeat them. True to his word, the armour bearer and Jonathan moved as one across the rocky train as they began their descent down Sina, pushing through thorny bushes which opened up to the narrow ravine floor. When the Philistines saw them coming, they shouted, Look, those Hebrews are crawling out of their holes. Come on up here and we'll teach you a lesson. Come on, climb right behind me, Jonathan said to his armour bearer, for the Lord will help us defeat them. Words meant to intimidate and frighten the pair instead spurred them on as they scampered up Bozes with renewed vigour. Now, I don't know about you, but when I arrived up the top of those cliffs, I would have been like, <laughs> all right, just, 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 just give me a couple of minutes. <laughs> just, all right. Let's go. So they climbed up using both their hands and their feet and the Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armour bearer killed those who came behind them. They killed some 20 men in all and their bodies were scattered over about half an acre. Despite the Philistine outpost being, outpost being better armed with long swords with an increased reach, Despite the Philistine army outnumbering them ten to one, with fresher men holding the stronger position of higher ground, Jonathan and his armour bearer routed them. Sudden panic broke out in the Philistine army, both in the camp and in the field, including even the outposts and the raiding parties. And just then an earthquake struck and everyone was terrified. Saul's lookout in Gibeah of Benjamin saw a strange sight. The vast army of the Philistines began to melt away in every direction. Calling the roll and to find out who was missing, Saul ordered. Call the roll and find out who's missing, Saul ordered. When they checked, they found that Jonathan and his armour bearer were gone. Then Saul shouted to Ahijah, Bring the ephod here. For at that time Ahijah was wearing the ephod in front of the Israelites. But while Saul was talking to the priest, Okay, so, so what do we do? Do we offer a sacrifice? Or, or maybe we call a special prayer meeting? Oh, where, where's the Urim and Thummim? You know, that, that, that's those two stones that we use to discern God's will. The confusion in the Philistine camp grew louder and louder. So Saul said to the priest, never mind, let's get going. Then Saul and all his men rushed out into the battle and found the Philistines killing each other. There was, a ter there was terrible confusion everywhere. Even the Hebrews, who had previously gone over to the Philistine army, revolted and joined with Saul, Jonathan, and the rest of the Israelites. Likewise, the men of Israel who were hiding in the hill country of Ephraim joined the chase when they saw the Philistine army running away. So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle continued to rage even beyond beth Aven. The story of two soldiers is a story of fear and a story of faith. A father, a 
a commander and a king, and the other, a son, a soldier and a prince. For Saul, his life was lived in fear, fear of failure, fear of the unknown, and on this occasion, fear of taking risks. For Jonathan, his life was a life of faith. Rather than licking his wounds and wondering what might have been, he stepped out in faith and trusted that when he put it all on the line, Yahweh God would meet him at his point of need. How do you choose to live your life? It's often the case that the more we have, the more protective we become. When the risks are there, we circle the wagons and we hold tight to what we have rather than stepping out in faith. For us today, the biggest reason why we miss opportunities to live life well is because we resist stepping out in faith until we're guaranteed a result. Based on fear, we would rather follow the path of caution than the path of of adventure. Middle class aspirations lulls our faith to sleep where it becomes impotent. God instead calls us to have a faith that is tested. God calls us to step out like Jonathan from under the shadow of a conservative circle of wagons tradition and live life well to live life where there are not always guarantees of success. Perhaps, perhaps the Lord will help us, for nothing can hinder the Lord. Perhaps God is in this. Perhaps. But isn't it better to give it a go than to look back and wonder, what if? Today, God is inviting you to be a part of the extraordinary, to live in the realm of perhaps, to live a life of risk, to live a life of faith, to live life well, with no guaranteed outcomes and no promise of worldly success. On the 13th of January in 1995, 26 years ago, God called me to take a risk and to step out in faith. But I tried to strike a deal with God. I'll go to Bible college. Yep, I know you're calling me to do that. I'll go to Bible college and I'll serve wherever you want me to go as long as I have Miss Mary beside me. God said to me, no deal. Regardless of whether Mary is with you or not, or if I choose to take her to be with me, I want you to follow me. Since that time, God has regularly called me to take risks. As he poses the question to me, do you love me more than these? Each time God has called me to live a life well, to live a life of faith and to attempt the extraordinary. I'm someone that failed high school, yet thanks to God and Mary's help, we graduated with a master's degree. Four and a half years ago, God called us to take a risk and move to Victoria, away from family and friends and a place that we'd lived in to join a new church family. God is still calling us to take risks and to keep stepping out in faith. Wouldn't it be romantic if, to think that all the heroes of faith in the Hall of Fame in Hebrews chapter 11, and, and if, it, if it just ended at verse 35, where women receive their loved ones back to life again from death, but the list goes on. In Hebrews chapter 11, 35 to 40, continuing on from where Amy started earlier in our service. But others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. 
They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prison. Some died by stoning and some were sawn in half. And others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All of these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us, so that they would not reach perfection without us. These heroes in the Hall of Fame lived their life in the realm of perhaps, taking risks for Jesus, and now they are expectantly waiting for you and for me to finish our race. If you want to follow religion that is safe and warm, a form of religion that is more attuned to self-help books that lulls you to sleep at night, then following Jesus is not it. Metaphors like take up your cross daily and losing your life have no place in safe, domesticated religion. These soldiers, Saul and Jonathan, show us two ways to live. When it comes to your choice of friends, study, career, where we live, what you do with retirement, when it comes to wrestling with the future of our church that God has placed us in, please don't be like Saul, filled with fear, settling down under a pomegranate tree, consolidating what you have and playing it safe. That's no way to live. Extraordinary lives like that of Jonathan and his armour bearer are those that move out of the safety and the security of the shadows. They move to the edge and live in the world of perhaps, where guarantees are rare and risks are are common, where God longs to meet us and with us impact the world by living life well. There are two ways to live. Which will you choose? Let me pray. Jesus, as we've spent some time looking at two soldiers, a father and a son, a king and a prince, someone that lived in fear and someone that stepped out in faith, was prepared to take hold of the perhaps and what could be and to trust you. Lord, we recognise that as life continues to change us and shape us, as we see the world around us and those that we've, we've journeyed through the world with, some of them have gone. Some of them are still with us. But Lord, as we look to the future, help us to be prepared not to just settle, not to consolidate what we have and play it safe. Help us at whatever stage of life we find ourselves in today to be prepared to live in the world of perhaps and to take risks for you and to live the life that you have given us, to live our life well. In Jesus' name, amen. So how might we respond today? In what ways or in what areas of your life are you tempted to settle? Where you find fear takes hold. There may be decisions that are coming up regarding health, friends, relationship, finances, work, whatever it might be. Where's fear in that? Where are you tempted to settle? 
If you could dream a God birth dream of perhaps, what would that dream be? Even now, what dream is God placing? What dream is God birthing in you? And what step of faith is God calling you to take today? There's going to be some music played and as that music's played, I invite you to respond to the things that God's saying to you. God bless you.